I'm very honored to participate in this uh, wonderful uh, commemorating conference and even more to chair the panel. So let me just uh, proceed uh, to our first speaker, who is Jia Jinhua, uh, a uh, professor of, uh, at the University of Macau and, and at Wuhan University, uh, who has received numerous memberships and fellowships, uh, mostly uh, in from the United States and China, and her research uh, interest is really impressive and, and wide ranging, and not just limited to philosophy, but also culture studies, religious studies, literature, and I mean books. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really um, amazing, and, and not just Confucianism, but also Buddhism and Taoism. So uh, I think that we're all looking forward to her talk. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to commemorate Li Lao Shi and to meet old and new friends. Li Zhenhao defines ethics as external social norms, such as institutions, regulations, and customs, and morality as internal individual psychology, comprising emotions, concepts, and the will. He also describes the interrelation and interaction between the two as ethics constructing morality and morality in turn feeding back to ethics. Therefore, the two evolves in an intellectual process from external to internal and then back to external. Li Zhenhao's distinction and definition of ethics and morality are not new. Some philosophers have held similar opinions. What distinguishes his theory from others is his unique description of the interrelation and interaction between the two. For example, Xuanin clearly distinguishes ethics from morality. He defines ethics as a domain which provides a commandment set up by external social authorities and morality as an inner domain which lays down a law of autonomy. This distinction and definition is roughly similar with Li Zhehou's. However, Shenin's view of the relation between the two is different. He proposes a breakthrough from the moral domain of the individual will to the ethical domain of the general will in order to harmonize the two for becoming equivalent concepts. Hegel also makes a distinction between morality and ethic. He defines morality as individual autonomy and free will, and the, the ethics as ethical behavior grounded in custom and tradition and developed in accordance with the objective laws of the community. This is also similar with Li Zhehou's, but like Shenin, Hegel's view of the relation between the two is also different. Hegel proposes to abridge individual subjective sentiments and the concept of general rights by a progressive transition from morality to ethics through the ethical orders of the family, society, and state. The development of classical Confucian ethical 
hormonal conceptions supports Li Zhehou's theory of the interaction between ethics and morality. Li Zhehou argues that Confucius grants richer ethical norms on Ren and in, internalizes external norms to become individual moral feelings. In a warning state, the discussion and debate between the internality and externality of ethical moral virtues is the best example for supporting the Zhehou's theory. Before the famous debate between Gaozi and Mencius on whether Ren Yi are internal or external, the Guodian manuscripts already discuss this issue. For example, both Yi, Yi Chong Yi and Liu De hold the view that Ren is internal and Yi is external. This is similar with Gaozi's argument. However, the most important text is the Wu Xing. It holds an opinion that all the virtues of Ren Yi Li Zhi are both external and internal. When the conducts of Ren Yi Li Zhi form within a person's heart mind, they are identified as conducts of virtue. In other words, conducts of virtue are motivated by a person's moral conscience and autonomous will. When Ren Yi Li Zhi are imposed by external social force, they are identified only as conducts. The external social force here refers to the richer ethical norms. Meanwhile, Shen, the fifth conduct and virtue, is always virtuous. And when it and the four conducts or virtue are in harmony, they are of the moral quality of the which originally belongs to heaven and represents heaven's way. When the four conducts enforced by social norms are in harmony, they are of the quality of shan, goodness, and belong to human's way, the ritual tradition. The authors of the Wu Xing hold a unique view that all the conducts of the Yi Li Zhi can be motivated both externally and internally, and they favor the internal source of moral motivation and affirm it as authentic virtue. This view represents an effort in following Confucius to further internalize the external ritual ethical norms to become people's autonomous moral virtues. Mencius follows and develops the Wu Xing's <coughs> distinction of external and internal virtues. First, Mencius' four beginnings of Ren Yi Li Zhi are originated from external ritual ethical norms. Mencius stresses the importance of ritual norms and discusses frequently how a person observes ritual norms when interacting with others in social contexts. Mencius strongly defends ease social function as lower duties, fitting each person's role and status. Like Confucius and the authors of the Wu Xing, Mencius also affirms Ren is extended from the ritual norm of Xiao, filial piety. In the month, there are 33 cases discussing Zhi, but about half is on the ability of kings and ministers in making proper judgment and strategy under political circumstances. Second, Mencius redefines the implications of the four beginnings now Ren begins with the moral emotion of compassion to all human beings 
Yi begins with the moral conscience of shame and disapproval in bad things. Li begins with the moral attitude of courtesy. And Zhi begins with the moral judgment of right and wrong. So the four external ritual ethical virtues now become inner moral virtues motivated by autonomous emotion, ideals, and the will. Mencius uses humans predispositional tendency of goodness as a starting point, but his purpose is not to establish a theory of human nature as many scholars have assumed, but rather to find a ground for internalizing the external demand of acting in conformity with Ren and Yi to become the autonomous moral practice of acting from Ren and Yi. This is the development of the Wu Xin's transform from the conducts enforced by external ritual norms to the conducts of virtue motivated by inner moral law. It is also similar with Kant's distinction of the difference between acting in conformity with duty and acting from duty. This process of internalization supports Li Zhehou's description of how external social ethics constructs internal psychological morality. By the lay warning states, the notion of internal moral conscience and virtues starts to feed back to social standards and new public values are formulated. This tendency is represented by the emergence of new concepts such as gong yi, public rightness, gong dao, the way of public rightness, zheng yi, righteousness, justice. These concepts transcend the hierarchical ritual norms to a general social context and often appear with the contrast and conflict between the spheres of public and private. These new concepts appear simultaneously in many warning states texts, including the Xunzi, Mozi, Han Feizi, Li Shi, Chun Jiu, Guanzi, and newly excavated bamboo and silk manuscripts. Among these texts, the Xunzi's discussion is the most clear and profound. For example, Xunzi indicates a good prime minister makes correct judgment on right and wrong and fairly treat the capable and incapable. In order to do so, he must shut out his private desires and hold gong dao. Gong dao is synonymous with gong yi, referring to rightness, fairness, and public interest. In the other term, tong yi, tong means tong xing, current, or chang gui, common norms. So Tong Yi refers to the current lower duties hierarchically grounded on the traditional ritual norms, as Xunzi says in other place. For the young to serve their elders, for the humble to serve the noble, for the unworthy to serve the worthy. These are the current Yi duties of all people. Xunzi believes that the way of public rightness and the current lower duty can be mutually compatible. From this example, we see that the concept of E first evolves from the external ritual ethical realm of lower duty to the internal individual moral conscience of rightness, and then in turn, goes back to influence social public values 
informs the general virtue of righteousness, fairness, and justice. This developing process of classical Confucian ethical moral theory provides evidence for Li Zhehou's theory that while ethics constructs morality, morality also feeds back to ethics. Thank you. Uh, so, Professor David Elstein is a professor of philosophy and Asian studies at State University of New York, New Paltz. Uh, his uh, research focuses on basically contemporary Chinese philosophy, uh, Confucian in particular, with a special focus on the uh, aspects of democracy, uh, liberalism and the ongoing dialogue uh, in political philosophy. So again, uh, it's um, touching the, um, the matters of cross-cultural uh, philosophy uh, or global philosophy, if you prefer. Uh, Maya, can you help mm -hmm. me and us with... Just a second. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, yes, sure. Yes, we do. All right, so I've changed the title of my presentation just a little bit to Kant and the Nature of Lewis Morality, uh, comparing Li Zihou and Mo Zongshan. Uh, there. Uh, so, presentation will have five parts. I'll first talk about Mo Zongsan's interpretation of Ruist morality, and then how Li Zihou criticized Mo, and then offered his own very different interpretation of Ruist morality, followed by an evaluation of Li's interpretation and then some concluding thoughts on how both of them are influenced by Kant and how that causes some trouble for their interpretation. And I'll suggest that by abandoning certain aspects of the Kantian view of morality, they can actually avoid a lot of these problems. Uh, so just briefly go over Mo Zongsan and how he was influenced by Kant and his interpretation of Ruism. Uh, and this will be familiar to most people, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, of course, Mo was very strongly influenced by the Kantian approach to morality that morality has to be necessary and unconditional and because empirical knowledge can never be necessary and empirical knowledge is contingent we could always find out that it's different from what we thought that the only way we can get this necessity is through a priori knowledge of morality as Tom thought then of course, the key move that Mo made is to say that Ruist philosophers were doing the exact same thing as Kant. They were interested in discovering the a priori basis of morality. Um, he began to develop this with Xinti Yu Xinti and continued um, through his later works uh, explaining how a priori morality was possible. And the common theme in these works is that it requires a free autonomous will. And again, the Kantian influence here is very clear. And autonomy for Mo means being independent from interests, inclinations, and anything external to the true self. Um, so he ends up setting up a two-tier picture. Uh, there's a true self belonging to the sense of, or, Sorry, the intelligible world or the numinal world. And there's an empirical self belonging to the sensible world. And for morality to be possible, it has to be determined by that true self, which has nothing to do with the sensible world. In short, the will has to determine itself and has to do so in a way that is free from the influence or control of anything sensible. And you know, I can only do a brief summary of this, um, so I won't go into how Mo attempts to prove this, but uh, concludes that various terms that Ruist philosophers use, such as the fundamental heart-mind, uh, that's the true self that is 
free of anything sensible and that issues a categorical imperative or something like a categorical imperative and that's what makes morality possible and so it accepts the view that morality has to be entirely a priori and that means free from the influence of anything sensible and in particular ordinary emotions and feelings that cannot be the basis of morality for both and that's exactly what Lee's going to criticize uh, and in part because he has a very different picture of what philosophy uh, is about for Mo, it's uncovering these a priori universal moral truths uh, Lee emphasizes much more history culture and he says in his history of classical Chinese thought that philosophy is about understanding a nation's cultural psychological formation uh, more specifically Chinese philosophy the goal is to understand the Chinese cultural psychological formation and modify it to fit the new century then notice when we're thinking of philosophy that way that means it is not discovering a priori truth because of course this cultural psychological formation is a process of historical accretion and what we call sedimentation and this happens in the sensible world that it's not something discovered through a priori reason and that means for lee that philosophy cannot ignore the sensible world it has to take into account these historical, cultural, technological, and other factors. And in his interpretation of Ruism, this is exactly what Ruiz philosophers did. And that the key move in Ruiz philosophy is that morality is based on psychological feelings, and it is not just a product of reason. And the main example he gives of this is Mengzi's heart that is not feeling toward others, the Wu Ren Ranger scene. In his, this is actually in his discussion of Songing Ruism, but he asks, what could this be if it's not a psychological feeling? Okay, how can we understand that? And, and so this motivates his own interpretation. And so morality is not truly based on reason, but there are these psychological feelings at the heart of it. Uh, but it's not just based on feelings. There needs to be reason as well. And it's integrated into what he calls the emotional rational structure, where the psychological feelings have formed the initial motivation, but has to be corrected, modified by reason. And in his discussion of Munza, he said this is exactly what Munza did put these psychological feelings at the heart of it but and here's where things begin to get a little bit confusing that Munza also made it a priori and there seems to be an evident tension there uh, if it's based on psychological feelings how can it also be a priori and why does it need to be anyway uh, well this is because uh, according to Lee Munza was an ethical absolutist. He says there are two forms of ethical theory. There's relativism and absolutism. Um, relativism, just what it sounds like, and ethical absolutism means there are universal, unconditional moral principles, and that's what Munza thought. And here's where we see the Kantian influence in Lee as well. There's a universal moral principle has to be a priori that's the only way we can have strict universality and his argument appears to be this Munza did assert their universal moral principles apply to all human beings the only way to have universal moral principles is if they're a priori and so even if Munza didn't say this explicitly he must have thought that these moral principles are a priori uh, because if it's just based on sensibility, this will be a form of relativism, uh, as he says is the case for Shunza. Uh, Shunza based morality on just sensibility, you know, ritual, learning, there's nothing a priori in it, and that's going to be a form of relativism. All right, so 
And let's consider Lee's interpretation and his criticisms of Mo. Uh, I want to say there is something to his criticism of Mo. Um, now, it does get a bit more complicated uh, because Lee says that Mo ignores the role of feelings, and that's not entirely true because Mo has this other category of ontological moral feelings, and Lee doesn't spend much time on that. Um, but you know, there are many philosophical issues with those, uh, and, but this is not uh, a Mo Zong San talk, so I won't get too far into that. But I do just want to say that the emphasis on feelings is difficult to explain away, and feelings that do seem to be fairly ordinary, sensible feelings. Um, you know, having a supportive environment uh, with family and friends seems to be very important in Buddhism. Um, and of course, again, Munz's own example, the heart that is not unfeeling to others, when Lee asks, what is this if not a psychological feeling? I think he makes a strong point. But this is not to say that Lee doesn't have his own problems. Uh, and chief among these, when he says that for Mung's morality is both a priori and empirical, what does that mean? How can it be both? That seems to be a contradiction. And Lee admits that it is something of a contradiction. And the way he resolves this contradiction is to turn to Shinzo. Uh, this is not so evident in his history of classical Chinese thought, but in some later works, uh, he makes this clear that uh, in order to avoid this difficulty, you know, he is inclined to Shinzo. And so let's say he says things like, learning and education are morals real source. And by saying that, it's clear that Lee is going to be giving up on the a priori in favor of the historical and cultural evolution of morality and through sedimentation and forming this uh, cultural psychological formation. Which would be fine, except there are still two problems right, that Lee has to face. First, he says morality based on sensibility must be relative, right, as he says Shinzo was. But Lee is not a relativist. Yeah. But if learning and education are morals real source, if it's all based on sensibility, right, how can he not be a relativist? Second, Lee says there are no a priori or innate human capacities. Uh, now, I take this to be a slight overstatement um, that he's not denying biological capacities altogether, but at least for moral capacities, that seems to be what he means. But if there are no such innate or a priori human capacities, what makes learning possible? And in fact, brings us this, up this problem in relation to Shinza. How can Shinza explain how learning ritual gets going to begin with without appealing to something a priori. And I think Lee has the same challenge. Why do people care about morality at all? That response to what we might call moral values, very broadly speaking, happens very early, cross-culturally, before much learning has even happened. And how is that possible? And Lee appeals to emotional capacities as the basis for morality. Um, and these can't be entirely learned, or at least it seems highly implausible that they're entirely learned. And again, there's a high degree of universality across cultures and some basic emotional expressions. So how can Lee resolve these problems? Well, I believe the way to approach this is to look at what's motivating the appeal to a priori in the first place. It's that, you know, that's the only way to account for morality being universal and unconditional. And I want to say, well, we don't have to think of morality that way. First of all, it's never entirely unconditional. Even in Kant, morality applies to all rational beings, so it's contingent on rationality. And for Lee, it's going to be even stricter than that because the foundation of morality is human social feelings. And so Ruist morality is going to be conditional on normal human social feelings. 
But that doesn't mean it's going to be relativism necessarily. Right? Because we can have a degree of universality that's not based on a pre a priori reason, as it's in fact not according to Lee. It's not an a priori necessary fact about human beings that they're social. Right? That's contingent. We can imagine it being otherwise with no logical contradiction. But even if it's conditional in that way, morality can still apply to everyone who satisfies that condition, right? to all normal human beings who have regular psychological feelings. Lee says morality must serve the continuous extension of human existence, and that's itself going to set some boundaries on what morality can be. It won't be identical in every society, but there are going to be some boundaries on what's possible due to what human beings are. In short, I suggest that Lee go back to a version of Munzer, an appeal to human nature, which is going to provide enough universality, but that doesn't have to be a priori. And I think that's the way you can avoid these problems. So to conclude then, in my view, both Lee and Mo accept the basic Kantian picture of what morality has to look like. It's to have necessity, it has to be a priori. And then they diverge from there. Mo tried to show that morality is in fact a priori, right, and that caused some problems. Lee tried to give up an a priori, a priori morality, but he couldn't give it up on it entirely, right? and that causes some problems. And I suggest for both of them, the way to avoid these problems is not to accept this Kantian understanding of morality. In other words, it doesn't have to be a priori, and we can get sufficient universality without that. Not strict, logical universality, yes, but good enough. And if we look at morality this way, then Lee can do what he wants to do. Morality can be based on human feelings. And in this way, that'll avoid the ontological challenges of Moe's view. We don't need that two-tier ontology. It runs into some numerous problems, which again, I won't go into. And Lee can have that focus on feelings as the basis of morality but without falling into relativism or without having to deny all innate capacities, which is very implausible. And this, I suggest, is going to be a better fit with realism. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we have just listened to the excellent, very succinct uh, talk of Professor Elstein. And now, given that we still have uh, some margin of time, uh, a little bit of improvisation never hurt nobody. So um, I'd like to invite and and on this occasion also introduce uh, Fei Xuan, who is a PhD student of Professor Wang Hui and currently works on a dissertation on Li Zhehou uh, to give uh, and unexpected maybe, but uh, I'm pretty sure a quite interesting uh, talk. Uh, Fei Xuan, are you there already? I see you. So, yes. Yes, can you see me? Yes. Uh, is my voice clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you guys give me this chance to make a brief presentation. Uh, I have just uh, uh, written a manuscript. Uh, Professor Wang Hui asked me to participate this conference yesterday. Uh, uh, it's my honor to be here to show my deep respect and uh, memory to Professor Li Zeho. I kept in touch with him between 2017 uh, and 2020. At first, by email, and later, by WeChat. During this time, I discussed with him mainly about the philosophy of history. I believe that the core of his thought is, is historical ontology. He said his historical ontology began with the theory of sedimentation, completed with drawing history into metaphysics. This term 
uh, being raised in combining Kant and Confucius in 2014. Li Zhe Hou positioned himself into the tradition of German historicism. We need to note that this tradition originated from Herder and reached its radicalization by Heidegger. In this sense, historicism is conservative, both politically and culturally. Whereas Li Zhehou made liberal and pra pragmatic applications, historicism was criticized, critic criticized even by William Dutai, Husserl, and Heidegger themselves. They all dissociated themselves from notorious historicism. However, the perspective that historicism leads to relativism is actually related to the treatment of history as material or content. The revolution in phenomenology made it possible for history to be thought as content with form. And Husserl used the term historical a priori to describe it in the origin of geometry. The revolution in phenomenology make possible the convergence of Chinese and Western thought. For example, Chinese scholars often made use of Max Scheler's Ethics of Emotion. In his Ethics of Emotion, moral emotion was described as material a priori. Although Li Zhehou rarely mentions phenomenology, we can still find uh, some factors in his historical ontology and emotion as substance. In fact, both history as substance and emotion as substance are non-substance. Li Zhehou published his historical ontology, this book in 2002. So interesting, in the same year, Ian Hacking, an American philosopher of science, also published a book of the same name, Historical Ontology, in Harvard University Press. Hacking referred to Foucault's history of historical ontology. We all know this term was invented in his famous article on Kant, what is enlightenment? So I would like to quote a passage from Hacking. He said, how we constitute ourselves as moral agents. That is the program of Kant's ethics. Foucault regularly historicized Kant. He did not think of the constitution of moral agents as something that is universalizable, apt for all rational beings. On the contrary, we constitute ourselves at a place and a time using materials that have a distinctive and historically formed organization. How we as peoples in civilizations with histories have become moral agents through constituting ourselves as moral agents in quite specific local historical ways. What, what I would like to point out is that both Foucault and Li Zhehou take the Kantian approach of the critic of historical reason. Both adopted a stance of the pragmatic of the self. Li proposes four periods of Confucianism, Ru Xue Si Qi, the desire emotion Confucianism. I'm not sure this translation is uh, the translation is proper. Qing uh, Yun desire emotion Confucianism. He wanted to establish a harmonized and balanced emotional rational structure. This reminds us 
focus the use of pleasure. When Li Zhao visited the United States in the 1980s, and when he came to teach there in the 1990s, French theory was becoming popular in the United States. I once asked Li if he had read Foucault's History of Sexuality, and he said yes. He had also read Foucault's What is Enlightenment? But as we all know, Li Zhehou was very negative about Foucault. But for a thinker who wants to go beyond postmodernism, it is impossible to, to disregard the theoretical resources of postmodernism. I'm not saying that Li Zhehou was influenced by Foucault. Rather, I'm saying that we can think about Li Zhehou and Foucault together for, for they be both advocate enlightenment while going beyond it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your talk and for the teaser of your uh, forthcoming dissertation. And I also hope uh, the book uh, which I'm personally very much looking forward to get acquainted with as, uh, as a person interested mostly in the philosophy of history. So uh, uh, unless uh, Professor Wang Haping shows up, I think not. So uh, I think our Q&A time is up. So please. Ask questions. Uh, Jana? No, uh, I only have a few remarks first to uh, face you. And, uh, of course, it was never intended that you participate in this conference uh, as a speaker, uh, but you were invited, of course, to participate as a listener and uh, discussion. But since uh, Professor uh, Wanke Pink could not make it, I hope once again, he's all right. Um, and since you said you have prepared something, uh, I think it was a brilliant idea that we included uh, your presentation into um, among the presentations of all other scholars. Um, it is always good, I think, to include young scholars and young people. Um, among the big and their fresh ideas uh, among us, the older ones. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, uh, I mean, we have, uh, I think, quite enough time for uh, discussion um, already uh, because, um, unfortunately, David Elstein's uh, contribution cannot be uh, discussed because he is not, I mean, it can be commented, of course, but he cannot reply because uh, he ha was only uh, was only able to join us uh, through um, with the video. Uh, what, uh, first, I have a brief comment only on uh, uh, Jia Jinghua. Uh, I enjoyed Professor Jia Jinghua's uh, presentation and also her paper. Uh, thoroughly and very much. I have as always. I have learned uh, a lot uh, of it. I just have two minor um, comments. Maybe uh, I'm always a little bit allergic, and I also think that we should uh, make some effort to universalize the the main uh, terms uh, in the ontology. So I'm always a little bit uncomfortable when uh, I see that people uh, still are translating the term ranching with human nature, uh, because we have to um, see this term as most others as uh, through the lens of the processual uh, philosophy and human nature is something very static. So I, for instance, I mean, there were several other uh, alternatives to that, what I, uh, what I like to, 
to um, uh, apply myself is humanist, not humanist. Humanist is run, but humanist is ranching. Uh, and then uh, I think that maybe um, it is uh, a little bit exaggerated if we want to uh, prove the correctness of any of Lidlhaus uh, theories through Schunze or the other classics. I mean, we can, of course, uh, always say that he was uh, in uh, uh, he was in line with the classics, which is a good thing. But if the classics say something similar or even the same, then Lidzow, this does not mean that uh, it does not prove this thesis right. I mean, if I have an idea and Roger has the same idea, this does not mean yet that the idea is correct, right? So we have to differentiate here between, uh, you know, just overlapping of the, uh, of a certain thesis and proving it right. So this, I would just have these two short comments on Professor Jia's uh, presentation, but thank you again very much for your speech. Yeah, maybe uh, the answer first and then the next questions. So Professor Jia, would you like to respond to these questions, remarks? Okay, thank you, Yana. Um, yes, I think you are right. We, we don't use human nature in Mencius case. I, I think I, I do not use this term in my paper, but I criticize others use it. I do not use it by myself. I, I think I, I don't use Humanness. I use predispositions of dispositions, so it's more like like uh, the xin qing, the xing in Chinese, more like this. Not really the universal human nature. So so actually, I I think in my notes I indicate um, it may not be correct to, to translate sin as um, human nature. I, I don't use it. <laughs> I think there are a couple of places where you use it, but I mean, this is just a general debate and uh, uh, it might also, I think um, you did write it. Uh, on one place or, or two, but the main thing is, is that we are all, I mean, my comment to us meant uh, I wanted to imply uh, that we have to stay aware uh, of this uh, different, um, uh, a little bit controversial um, issues that are accompanying our research all the time. But it, it also can be that you have uh, that I have overlooked it and uh, and that you only applied it in a quotation that that might be in a translation yes. of quotation. In the one place I put it in quotation is to mm -hmm. translate mm -hmm. a scene as mm -hmm. a predisposition and nature. But here nature just means singer. Nature also yeah. means singer. No. So I yeah. do not use human nature together, just nature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I use it as a nature and also in a quotation, it means just singer, mm -hmm. the same as this person yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there are, yeah. yeah. There are uh, two other hands, uh, otherwise we could, we could continue this discussion, but there are two other hands in yeah. the air. So uh, I, uh, as I remember, Professor Li Chenyang uh, was was first, and then Professor Roger Ames. Well, thank you, uh, David. Um, I have a question for Professor Jia Jinghua, but before that, uh, I would like to make a comment on David Elstein's presentation. Too bad he's not here, but I think it's an important point that we consider uh, in his presentation. So I put it over there as a comment and invite a response from an audience since he's not here. 
That is whether uh, Lizaho was a relativist. Uh, David says it's not. I think it, uh, it depends on in what sense we interpret relativity. Uh, Lizaho was not a subjective relativist for sure. He was not. But he was a, a historicist. And if you think in that way, in the broader sense, historicism is a kind of relativism. And also he emphasized the cultural differences between Chinese and non-Chinese, Western men. And in that regard, I also sense a strong dose of cultural relativism in his moral philosophy. I just want to raise that and want to see whether other colleagues in the audience have any comments on it. Now my question for Professor Jianyinghua, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, but uh, when we're talking about the difference between ethics and the morality uh, in association with Li Zihou, uh, I, I think if you mostly uh, use your you know, uh, material from uh, Chinese uh, philosophy, ancient Chinese philosophy, uh, more or less along the line of uh, you know, Wu Xing, for example, De Xing versus De Xing, uh, conduct then uh, kind of virtue on that level. And you quote from uh, quite a few uh, sources, but you did not um, uh, draw some parallel between uh, Kong uh, Li and uh, Ren. Uh, be, you know, ethics, morality on the one hand and Li and uh, Ren on the other. And Li has norms mostly and the Ren is kind of internalized. Uh, virtue quality. Uh, as uh, you must know, uh, Li Zihou wrote this Ren Yu Jin Du, in which he dedicated quite a bit of discussion on Li and Ren. So I just want, I'm curious why you did not, you leave that analogy out, uh, parallel out. And also I want to hear your thought on that, the parallel between ethics, you know, Ren Li, and the li, 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 li on the one hand, and the morality, dao de, and the ren on the other hand, in the analects. Thank you, in advance. Yes, please. Uh. Um, okay, um, thank you, Chen Yang. Um, I, I, I think that I give a uh, a note about Li Zhehou's um, the internalized the Li to Ren, ground, ground the Li ritual on the basis of Ren. And, and also, so I, I think I give uh, just a few nights to talk about this. Uh, and I pass it, uh, pass it over because this topic already, you know, everyone already knows. So I, I think I don't need to talk talk it on it more on this this. Um, Dijon, he has the the uh, the whole book. Um, Yu Yu Dao Li Shi Li Gui Ren, the whole book. So I think everyone already knows this. So I want to start with you no know, after Confucius and before Mencius. So that's the yeah manuscripts. So I just important that's why. But I think that all this already discussed by others. So I just pass it and then start with the Guardian manuscript. So that, that's. Um, and also, so actually, Li Liaoshi was not the first to talk about um, internalization of from ritual to Ren, like grounded ritual on Ren. So actually, this time I found um, Xu Fu Guan was the first to, to indicate this very important, insightful 
point. So previously I, I didn't notice this, but this time because I I read read again Xu Hu Guan's Zhongguo Ren Xin Lun Shi. So I found actually he already talked about this. And then Benjamin Swas, he followed Xu Hu Guan to, to discuss this, to follow this point further again. But Swartz, he didn't mention Xu Hu Guan. So, but this time I found Lisa Ho was not the first to talk about this, the from ritual to learn all the relationship between between Li and Ren. So so I, I think I get I give a note to indicate this from Xi Fu Guan to Benjamin and to Li Zheho. Thank you anyway. Yeah. Thank you for your complex response. And we still have Professor Ains. I don't know what time is it out there, but uh, we are very appreciating that, that you're eager to, to ask questions. So please go ahead. It, it, it just turned midnight. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, I think uh, Yang is really uh, making a very important point, And that is that <clears throat> Um, a pernicious relativism uh, is uh, Chen Yang is Chen Yang and Roger is Roger, and we have no way to criticize each other. That um, the, and when you do, when you do cultural relativism, then it really becomes pernicious. Um, but um, in a historicist uh, model. Um, there's no gaps like that. That kind of relativism is another kind of absolutism. Uh, Chen Yang is law unto himself, and Roger is law unto himself. But historicist means that there's no gaps that we that we're continuous. And if it's continuous, then it's pluralism, not relativism. You know that um, uh, there are many different cultures, and um, there's many different historical periods, and. And we have to uh, accommodate uh, their differences, but but they're continuous with one another. So the idea of idol buffet, you know, is kind of holistic um, way of thinking. But my question is uh, for uh, Jiao Laoshir. Um, I wonder, like one of, one of the problems that we have, we kind of talked about that with um, with Xiao Ming too, and that is that when we talk about external and internal. And when we're moving between the traditions, it's very easy to think of internal in terms of innate a priori and external um, experience. Um, you know that um, there's a there's a kind of a an internal external dualism, and so it can't be both a priori and experience. Those are separate. That are different, but the the nei wai categories in Chinese are correlative categories. They're yin yang categories, and so it, it, they 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 have a different relationship. That um, that 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 nei is implicated in wai, and wai is implicated in nei, and so I, I think it it makes your point. You know, it strengthens your point. Uh, like I, I thought your paper was brilliant. You know, the the this kind of of um, of and and we find it like Wu Xing Wu Xing Pian, you know, first chapter of Wu Xing Pian, you know, if you internalize it, then it becomes duh. If you don't internalize it, it just becomes doing what other people say is ren, you know that that um, I mean those examples are all over the place in these these early texts. So um, what do you think about the the understanding of internal and external? In a correlative way, as opposed to a dualistic way. Uh, I, I, I'm so, I, I, sorry. In what way? Um, what, what I'm saying, like if you if you look at um, the Zhong Yong, Zhong Yong says, "Xing zhi de, he nei wai zhi dao ye," you know. That that um, that you're putting the inner and the outer together with Xing uh, Zhu but um, um, but when when we look at Kant, 
when Kant is talking about internal, he's talking about a priori. Um, when he's talking about external, he's talking about experience, the empirical. And those two things don't go together. They're dualistic. They're separate, you know. Uh, but but uh, nei wai is not separate in Chinese. Nei wai is, is mutually entailing. Okay, I, I, I got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think it's different in, in the Chinese um, ideals, nei and wai. But I, I think the nei wai just became popular after Confucius passed away because the Guodian manuscripts just in the middle between Confucius and Manchus. So there are, there, there are a lot of discussion about Mei Wai. Liu De, Li Chong Yi, and Wu Xing. And after, after Menzi, there are more. Guan Zi, Li Shi Sun Zi also talk about Mei Wai. And, and you are right, Mei and Wai are not just separated, definitely. You, you are right. I think I, I need to talk more about this in this point. Because both are virtues, you know, internal that follow one's heart mind. That's virtue. But external follow the ritual. That's virtue too. So um, the authors of Wu Xing use De Zi Xing and Xing, but still the Xing, the only thing without the, the virtue, still the virtue, right? To follow the ritual still is important. So I think about this to maybe to discuss this a little bit. Thank you. Uh. If I may make a short follow up to that, uh, because uh, we are skipping from Li the whole to classical Confucianism. Uh, so I think that it, it's really uh, always good to bear in mind that these ideas traveled a distance of time. And since I'm personally digging into some Buddhist links in between, uh, I also think that this is the case here. So if we think about the ideal of uh, nation, why one? There's clearly no uh, opposite dualism in the sense of uh, one thing excluding another. It's, it's just totally reverse. Uh, but Buddhism introduces another sense of uh, innerness that is new uh, to the Chinese thought, I think. And the same concerns, uh, and then, of course, Li Zihou comes with all the uh, heritage of Western philosophy that is being uh, overthought. And the same concerns, I think, nature, uh, which was the subject of, of, of Yana's question and then uh, Professor Jia Jin Hua's uh, response. Uh, personally, for me, Zhenxing and Mencius is human predisposition. Uh, and a predisposition as a category, of course, it's a Western one, somehow escapes uh, the division into ontology psych and psychology or psychology and moral philosophy. It's like predisposition, what humans are predisposed to do. And Confucius somehow refrained from speaking about that. But then comes Buddhism with its own idea of tathata and generally nature that is imbued with all the Brahmanical meanings. So washing, for instance, as Buddha nature is, is definitely not predisposition of Buddha, much less in a psychological slash moral sense. So then, of course, Li Zihou, who is writing about the naturalization of humans and humanizations of nature, operates with, again, different notion of nature. So even if he goes back to Mencius is it is rare reading of, of these ideas for the prism of what happened in both after Buddhism. And we can see that clearly in Neo-Confucianism, how the Cheng brothers operate with the concept of nature and of course, Western philosophy. Uh, so I think this is uh, that aspect that, that is intriguing and, and should be taken into account. Uh, Jana has uh, a question. Just a very short one for Professor Jia. Um, again, because you mentioned uh, also this, this um, idea has 
uh, originally it was proposed by Shifu Guan already. So what I found it interesting is that uh, Lizzo Hall was actually against this old stream of uh, modern new Confucianism. But for instance, he really disliked Mo Zong San and his, um, his uh, metaphysical discourse. But as far as I could uh, see uh, in Lidzo Hall's work, he always had an affection to Shifu Guan. I could not come across one single, uh, one single passage where he would be uh, criticizing uh, Shifu Guan like he was criticizing Mo Zong San, for instance. So I was wondering, uh, especially also because uh, my PhD student, uh, Maya, Maya Maria Gosset, uh, she is writing uh, for her PhD thesis, a comparison uh, between Shifu Guan and uh, Li Zihou on the origins of uh, Chinese culture. So I, I wanted to ask you if you have maybe uh, some advices um, for this kind of conversation between these two scholars, um, both interested in aesthetics also, uh, or at least if you can, uh, if you can provide us with uh, some more literature in this regard, because I found that uh, quite interesting, uh, interesting what you were saying in this regard, please. Uh, okay, no advice, but I, I think because I do it, uh, Xu Fu Kuan's work, Zhong Guo Ren Xin Lun's, this yes. mock. I, I read it before, but I, I didn't, didn't pay much attention. But this time, I read it very carefully. And I found, so actually, Xu Fu Kuan was much more familiar with the classical period than Mo Zhong Shang. Yes. And the many others. The many others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mo Zhong Shang, no knew more on the Songming, you know, Li Xue, near Confucianism. But mm -hmm. he, he didn't really, you know, he, he, he was not really familiar with the classical period, preaching period, the, mm -hmm. the, the classical philosophers. And Sui Fu Guan also, he was the first to talk about um, Although his book is titled History of Chinese Theory of Human Nature, but yeah. he was the first to talk about Mencius was not just talk about human nature. The more, in talk, talk, more important is Xin had mind. He was mm -hmm. the first to Xin in the point. That, yeah, the mm -hmm. Xin had mind. And, and so the now many scholars are talking about the moral psychology. But I think Xu Fu Kuan was the first to talk about this. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Uh, if you will need uh, some more advices, we will write to you if you are OK with that. Yeah. And, and, and you can advise us further in, your, in, in the email correspondence, if you agree. We would be very happy. Okay, uh, so if, if there are no questions, I have a question, if I may, of course, to Fei Xuan. Uh, <laughs> I, I know maybe that this is still, again, very spontaneous, <laughs> but uh, I'm really looking forward to reading your dissertation uh, based just on what I have just heard, okay? Uh, I'm uh, personally not totally convinced uh, to uh, present uh, Lee the host philosophy of history as prima facie historicism, mm -hmm. uh, since he himself is not denouncing the term historical materialism. Uh, on the other hand, he wants to somehow purge it, uh, purify it. Uh, he's writing about Wei Wu Shi Guan de He Xin, so he's trying to uh, present, uh, portray uh, his idea of the history making, manufacturing and use of tools as the proper kernel of historical materialism. Everything else is, is bullshit or uh, transcendent <laughs> in the language of Kant. 
So the class <laughs> struggle, uh, as he writes in Marxist uh, uh, this is one of the worst ideas that Marx had. In Gaubia Gaming, we are uh, going through his uh, harsh criticism of the concept of revolution. Uh, what else? Uh, many concepts from the capital, I mean, like basic notions, are uh, rejected by him as, as these uh, transcendental illusions, so value theory, etc. But I would say that his um, motive, in a way, is protestant. He wants to uh, come back to these sources, save Marxism. I mean, this whole um, aspiration and hope is post-Marxist in the sense that he's selectively um, rejecting or cherry-picking this and that. But I would say that he's very stubborn until very late dates. <laughs> he is a historical materialist, right? And even in historical ontology, you're saying Heideggerian, yes, but he's at the same time quite skeptical towards uh, Heidegger's, uh, maybe not a historicism, but the way he's uh, detaching himself from uh, material sphere of production. And as, as, far, as far as I recall, the, the first passages, paragraphs of Lisha Bantiruen, he's not avoiding term uh, historical materialism, right? Uh, even if many Western post-Marxists say Chantal, Move, and Laclau, uh, actually South American, Western, uh, will not agree with such uh, a re-reading of historical materialism, uh, Lisa Ho would say, so the worst for them. So, uh, Feshuan, what do you think about uh, uh, Lidze Ho as, as historical materialist? I'm not saying he's not historicist, uh, historicist, but this is the like the point of intersection, maybe, of, of the two. Definitely not just historicism. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think he's just, you know, just a historicist. I think he has a strong dose of Marxist uh, historical humanism. And what uh, Wu Xiaoming mentioned earlier, the yeah. kind of uh, private social practice based on labor, we found Laodong as the fundamental uh, grounding of human society. And uh, he called the Ban Qi, that is ultimate foundation. Uh, I was going to use the reality and di different meaning, and Roger said that's not a good way to go. So I would say fundamental grounding of human society. Uh, so, um, uh, and, you know, the relativism has a different meaning. So uh, you can be, I use relativism as opposed to absolutism. And in that sense, I think, uh, Lizzo was not a radical relativist for sure. So he was a historical uh, materialism, a historicist materialism is based on kind of a social reality, mm -hmm. the human practice kind of Marxist idea. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, history evolves. And uh, today is a better stage than, more advanced stage than yesterday. Uh, in history, the not in short period, I mean long period. Uh, also, what worries me most on this whole is that uh, something Yana indicated, hinted earlier, is that from there, he goes on uh, cultural relativism and emphasizing the Chinese uniqueness. And then he himself was not a radical nationalist, definitely not. But from the, his philosophy, uh, there is just one step away to carry out uh, the idea that we Chinese are different. And uh, today in China, you see many, many people thinking along that line. I don't know to what extent they were influenced by with the whole all by some <laughs> other sources. But I do see some connection there. That's why I'm cautious as we study the whole and um, how much we can embrace from his thought. I just want to issue that 
as a mark, a mark that are for us to think about. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I think we have to conclude because we are running out of time. Uh, Jana, uh, maybe a, a minute or two to face you and to, to, to reply if he's willing to, or should we move it into another discussion? Uh, I don't know, but we are 10 minutes late already. Okay, so minutes. for the next discussion, we have only... Yeah. 20 minutes, which is really, yes. um, okay. but I, I hope there will be other opportunities to continue this interesting debate, even if, uh, even if uh, by emails, sure. if it's not, we only, unfortunately only have one day. Uh, I'm accepting. Well, just a, uh, a few seconds, uh, just add a, a reference, you know, uh, to what, uh, uh, have just said, and it, it, especially I heard uh, uh, mentioning of uh, uh, mentioning of uh, Heidegger. Uh, there's a hole in his uh, historical ontology at page 13. Uh, after he says "zui zhong shi zai," then he uh, put in brackets uh, "being of beings," which is. Uh, uh, very clear reference to Heidegger. And uh, uh, this shows Li Zihou, uh, Li conception of uh, uh, his Benti is not uh, very clear, maybe uh, clear to himself, but uh, not to my reading. So can be translated uh, like an you know, ultimate reality, but uh, Li Zihou also mean, means it to be being of beings in Heidegger sense. Okay, that, that, that's all. Okay. So I think we could now just uh, give the words to Maya. Uh, but before that, I would uh, like to like to thank to David Rogac for sharing this interesting pan panel and to all three uh, presenters, of course, also. And now let's proceed um, to the next panel. And the chair is Maya Crossets. We are quite late already, but we will try to shorten our presentations. 